but the cameras are, are quite spread out. So we're going to be hiking for four or five miles to the south and then four or five miles to the north. We're going into some really deep canyons and we're also going to set a camera clear up in the scree on the very high ridge. So overall, these cameras are spread over probably 10 to 12 square miles. And just upstream from here, there's a major game trail crosses. So I'm thinking that's a great place to create a real stink and set up a camera. The batteries will allow the cameras to operate for approximately 30 days, at which time Dr. Hall will return to retrieve them before elk season begins. Look at the beam. Okay, I'm going to try to get the laser beam to hit right in those trees, okay? Help ensure chances of success. The team is using bait to help lure the great ape to the camera station. We're going to add some additional adornments this morning to our camera set. So we've got some CDs here, which we're going to hang in a tree and let the wind move them around, and hopefully that reflection will catch some attention. Uh, we're also going to be hanging up some uh, sliced-up onions to create some smell. Hey, guys, look at this game trail. Man, look at this. It's perfect. Got a perfect set of trees here. Got a Look at, look at that. There's a lot of wildlife down here. Well used trail. Yeah. Okay, and it's high. The wind's going to blow the scent around. This is, this is perfect, right? Right, right in the good. middle of the swamps. Let's do it. Apes, like many animals, display curiosity. And foreign objects and scents can bring animals in for a closer look. There's a lot of indications that Bigfoot is very curious, and there have been several situations where he's been attracted to music. So we're going to create some music for him. We're going to hang up some wind chimes. Dr. Hall has used wind chimes before. The strange, non-threatening sounds bring many animals closer to investigate. He is hoping for the same results with Bigfoot. As Hall and his team reach 6,800 feet near the top of the tree line, they make a discovery. Here we have another one that's pretty distinct. Several human-like footprints pushed into the loose dirt. It must be a strange place for someone to come in their bare feet. Uh, it seems awfully wide for a human track, but it's not a huge track like like you would expect with Bigfoot, uh, but possibly it could be a young animal. Dr. Hall has brought along hunting guide Mark Alman, who has 32 years of local animal tracking experience. It's not a bear track, and it's not a cat track. Here's the print here. It stepped on this stick right here, so it comes out to here. Um, and then we got another one here that's kind of a heel print, but there's no tin shoe marks or, I mean, nothing of, nothing that a human would be leaving here. With measurements of nine inches long and four inches wide, it is possible a human could have made them. But they have not seen another man now in three days riding. They will deploy cameras in this area as well. Okay, for our last camera set, we're spraying this tree with uh, wintergreen pure essential oils. This is a very concentrated scent, which we're hoping will stay for a while. We set it up right along the game trail and right, right uh, close to the creek. So, uh, and we've also hung some uh, CD. Uh, this up here to kind of spin around in the wind. So this is our our last trap, and we'll see what happens. The cameras will have almost a month to do their work, at which time Hall will return to collect them and the photos they contain. Christine Wall's team has now been in the field for a total of five days. Mm -hmm. But we should, because that's definitely where the activity is coming from. And, the and have found something interesting. When I saw that, I actually started exploring the area a little more. And this is when I saw this other branch. It's broken in a similar fashion. You can see that none of the other longer branches are disturbed. So yeah. that makes me think something purposefully grabbed it and snapped it. And these also have been grabbed. And instead of brushing to the side, they're actually pulled straight down. Oh, those are very, very fresh. Yeah. So this is a really interesting bedding site because you can actually see where this uh, grass has been just pushed down and bedded, and yeah. there's obvious branches that have been laid down. There's there's no way that elk 
take branches off of trees and move them. I mean, if an elk breaks a tree limb, it's going to be right where the tree is. Or bear. There's not, or these, bear. these did not come off of this tree. This came from a different location. Something carried it here. However, there is no hard evidence of what made the nest. But having collected their camera traps, the team finds something has triggered the motion-activated cameras. It's four pictures. If the stories of the legendary Bigfoot are to be believed, this primate is nearly eight feet tall and walks upright. And most eyewitnesses say it looks like this creature captured on film in 1967. This man was there when the film was shot. This man believes he made a body cast of a Bigfoot. Whatever made the impression was indeed very, very heavy. And this experiment concluded the walk of the subject in the Patterson footage is outside the range of a human. Monster Quest followed two expeditions in Washington state as researchers and wildlife biologists made an effort to find evidence of Bigfoot. Dr. Briggs Hall put out baited camera traps in a remote area where humans do not venture. Time for the payoff. We're finally going to find out if we got pictures. Mark, it says we've got 48 photos on camera number four. Well, you know, after a week of hard hiking and 30 days of the cameras being in place and a long, long day and part of a night on horseback, we're finally going to get a look at what's on these cameras. Dr. Hall's cameras collected over 90 images during the 30 days they were in commission. I would expect that we'll get some elk and we'll get some deer and maybe we'll get a bear too, maybe a coyote. And if we were incredibly lucky, possibly a Bigfoot. I tried to see if there was anything there that we could justify calling a Bigfoot, but there simply wasn't. Christine Wall's team was also camped near Mount St. Helens. They too had cameras in hand. That's interesting, okay. So it's number 113. Come here and look at this and you tell me what you think. In the far right corner of the screen there is a dark object. Is this the appendage of an animal just out of frame? When they examine additional images they find traffic. The image is likely just the tail end of a truck hauling dark cargo. After viewing all the images from the camera traps, it is clear elk are everywhere, but no sign of a Bigfoot. And what about the footprint they found on day three? The cast provided no details. It is not known if there ever were dermal ridges, but if there, they have been washed away by the rain. However, they were able to find something of interest. We don't have a lot of bedding areas or nests that are recorded at all. I mean, I've excavated one. I know of a couple others, and that's it. So this is pretty exciting in the Skookum area to have something like this. It's clearly not elk-related. There's no reason for a human to be doing this. For the past 40 years, the best evidence for Bigfoot has been the footage shot by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin in California. When I got to see the film, finally, when I got to see the film, yeah, I was really relieved to, to see that, it, that he got that much because Roger said, I don't know, Bobby said, I'm not even sure that I got any film footage at all because he said, I fell down and I got relocated and then I got relocated again and then I ran out of film. For the first time, the original 16 millimeter film is being examined on a microscopic level. Researcher Owen Caddy used a digital microscope to take pictures of individual frames of the film. Joining Caddy is Dr. Darris Swindler. They are viewing the comparisons for the first time. They look first at the leg for any detail that might be compared to the Skookum cast. That one's sort of interesting, but uh, here's where they start to get really pretty interesting. Unfortunately, it's too grainy. So Darris, you can see here, on this uh, image, it's uh, just the full color image digitally pulled off the film. But as they focus their attention on the subject's head, they make an amazing discovery. And as you look at the enhanced one, you can see that the level of detail has right. been pulled out. And you can individual parts of the face. Yeah, you can resolve the individual parts of the face, the nostrils, mm -hmm. the mouth. 
When the original film is blown up to a headshot of the creature, the image becomes just a fuzzy blob. But when the enhanced digital image is blown up to the same size, the new details emerge. You could see the eyelids move up and down. That's muscle there around there, the circular muscle called the orbicularis oris. It particularly well developed was the masseter, this big muscle over here that moves a jaw. And this is the most interesting sequence of the mouths opening and closing. What's uh, interesting in that it shows the movement of um, the mouth and, and the sides of the face and the yeah. lips. So there's quite a bit resolved, and there's actually a lot of detail that uh, is consistent from frame to frame, mm -hmm. and you get a consistent facial morphology looking at multiple frames. People have often thought of the film subject's mouth as being higher up than it, than it actually uh, is. And you see how that can happen, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, here's a picture of Pan, yeah. um, a chimpanzee. And you think that the mouth is, is actually where this dark line is, but it's mm -hmm. actually below that uh, in the deep shadow. It's, there's a similar analogy that? here. Yeah. yeah. That's good, comparison. <clears throat> If there had been a mask on some animal, a human or something like that, it was a well, <laughs> a well fabricated mask. I'll say that, which I sort of doubt now more than I would have back in those days. I don't see anything that stands out and, and glaringly says fake. You know, the way the mouth uh, can move and even makes. Uh, Facial uh, expressions that are similar to those of chimpanzees, like a, you know, the uh, compressed lip display. Uh, you know, I don't know who would think of that. Bob Gimlin, who is the only living eyewitness from that day in 1967, is certain of what he saw. I was watching the creature and it was walking away, but I could see the face real good and I could see the eyes. The digital view of the original Patterson footage did not reveal any telltale seams, zippers, or other evidence that would point to a man in a monkey suit, but rather it seemed only to reinforce the eyewitness testimony. Somebody once told me, uh, you know, you never use a, a bigger hammer than you need for the job, and, and I imagine if they're going to film with 16 millimeter, they're not going to be concerned with details that fine. Um, I don't think anyone would have anticipated the ability to come back 40 years later and do uh, photo enhancements to show details uh, this great. I, I, I really regretted that I was there and saw it because of the ridicule and because of my wife being upset at me and practically thinking about divorcing me because of the thing, you know, and uh, and the people saying they faked this and faked that, and, you know, and uh, it, it just, it bothers a person. 